First Timothy chapter four. If you would like to follow along with me. First Timothy chapter four, beginning in verse eight. I'd like to read through verse ten. <coughs> it says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor, and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. I recently saw a video dealing with specifically verse 10, and the claim that was made in this video is that this is a glaring contradiction because how can God be the savior of all men but also those who believe this individual is being very dishonest it's a very simple thing to point out but one that perhaps we need to think about God being the savior of all men but especially those actually especially those that believe the point here is, who did Jesus die for? Even going back before that, this says God is the Savior of all men. This, I would say, points to the unity of the Godhead in participating in man's salvation. Just in the creation account, you have each person of the Godhead participating in physical creation. Each had their role. You see the Father spoke. Really the first person the Godhead spoke. The second person executed that will. And we see the third person organized the different parts of matter. And then you can read throughout the rest of that chapter to see how the creation account unfolds. The scheme of salvation is no different. Each person of the Godhead participates in man's salvation. They do not have the same role, but they all do participate. Specifically, Jesus came to the earth and died for all of mankind. So in that instance, he is the Savior of all men. We see this in John chapter 3, verse 16. One of the, probably one of the more quoted passages of the entire Bible because everyone's familiar with it. Everyone usually misrepresents it because they think it gives them a license to sin. But nonetheless, the truth taught in that verse points to Jesus being our Savior. But then you have the closing phrase of verse 10, and that is, especially of those that believe. Now this word specially deals with particularly. This group of people is special. They're different. They're set aside. Really, you could look at this as the ones that are sanctified. They're set apart for a use. And this, as we'll note in a few moments, are those who believe. But how is this different from all men? Well, I've pointed out before, if I set my wallet on top of the pedestal up here, I offer it to everyone who wants to take it. You're not guaranteed that anything's in it, but it's still a wallet. It might have a license or two in it, so if you want to copy my identity, maybe it's not going to get you very far. But it's for you. But who actually gets the wallet? The one who comes up here and gets it. Now, I'm not going to do that. But it's my wallet. But if I did do that, I offered it to everyone. That wallet's for everyone, but it's only taken by the one who comes up and gets it. Also think about the menu on Mama's supper plans. The menu is always the same. Take it or leave it. Jesus has died for all men. Salvation has been made available to all men. But who are those who benefit specifically from it? Those who follow the commandments. Those who obey Him. 
When you're sitting down to eat supper, what are you going to have? You're going to get a healthy dose of take it or leave it. You might be going hungry for the next eight hours, or you might get to taste mama's cooking. Choice is yours. We see a further insight to this in Hebrews chapter 5, a passage that I know we're familiar with. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Here's the key. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Obey him. You see, salvation, once again, has been extended to all of mankind. But this beautiful promise of eternal salvation can only be taken by those who obey Jesus, who respond to the gospel's call, become Christians, and live faithful lives to the day of their death, through the day of their death. Now, this particular verse speaks of eternal salvation. You see, now... In the flesh, we enjoy salvation. We have the promise of the Father that if we're faithful to Him, we will obtain heaven when our lives in the flesh are over. That's not the same as this salvation. Eternal salvation is after we do die. God has made it such a way that we as humans, glorified humanity, just as Jesus is, when we occupy heaven, we will never be able to leave heaven. God has made it so we can always obtain or always live out in heaven with Him throughout the rest of what we would call eternity. How do you describe that except for poor words? They can't begin to describe how beautiful that place will be. But Jesus is the author of this eternal salvation. But it's made available to everyone, but only those who obey Him are benefactors of it. So this afternoon, as is customary, we wish to extend the invitation to those who are not Christians, those who perhaps would like to become a Christian by obeying the gospel, ultimately being baptized for the mission of their sins, becoming a Christian, becoming a child of God, being a recipient of this great promise of salvation and eternal salvation. Or as a member of the church, perhaps you've not been living as a Christian, Make it right. Restore your relationship with your God through repentance and prayer. If you have either of these needs, please let us know as together we stand and sing.